much indeed. Um, Tom, our brilliant head of marketing, has been picking the walk-on music today, and I said to him, do not pick Carly Rae Jepsen for an I walk on, and he's disappointed me there, which is a shame. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about mobile in the year of mobile. It's possibly the most clickbaity title I could think of uh, to retain your attention for the next 20 minutes. Um, and, and more of year of mobile in a second. Um, it being the year of mobile, it's kind of got me thinking that we do take some stuff for granted. We take for granted the fact that all of the devices in our pockets are pretty intuitive and they're designed that way and, and probably the vast majority of us find them very easy to use. It's not the case for my dad, unfortunately. So my dad's uh, 64. Um, I saw him at the weekend and he turned up and he pulled, he's got like a, uh, a very basic Huawei phone. He pulls it out and the torch is on. I said to him, you know, the torch is on. He said, yeah, it's been on for like a week. I can't turn it off. <laughs> So it, even the most basic of things that we might take for granted, poor old dad, like we managed to do it in about 10 seconds, but it got me thinking about a clip that I'd seen um, where actually if you kind of flip reverse it and you think about what if you put some mobile natives to task on something that my dad would have found rather easy. So have a look at this. Okay, so go ahead and lift up the box. You have four minutes to dial that phone number. That's it? Oh, no, zero's all the way over. Oh, yeah. How about restart? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the way around back here. Dude, that makes sense. Bring it all the way around, and then... And then, like... Bruh. Take the phone, and then do it? Put the phone to your ear. What do you hear? What does it sound like? Mm, one minute. <laughs> What's with all the holes, though? Oh. Zero. Zero, we did it. Okay, so like, you may be at the year of mobile, but you know, um, trying to work out some of this old stuff is still pretty hard. Here's some context uh, as to why I'm talking to you about mobile, um, uh, lots of which won't be a surprise to some of you. And the bit that I want you to focus on is the bit that Richard kindly introduced me to, uh, is my time at Mindshare, a media agency. In, in 2012, I became Mindshare's first head of mobile, which was uh, incredibly exciting. And I went on to do that same role, but traveling around the world and doing it. And you got to see loads of uh, amazing things. And as a head of mobile, you get to do some pretty exciting things. I wrote a blog. I gave it a very witty title. I called it Hashtag the New Oil which I thought was quite clever then, probably still do a little bit now. Um, I did things like this. I got obsessed with creating outlines of phones. And so my sort of PowerPoint obsession matched with my mobile obsession means I spent far too much time doing things like this. Um, and I also did stuff like this. These are mobile top trump cards, which uh, I would take out to clients. There's like 50 of them. Uh, and it was supposed to cut through the complexity of clients going, I, I know I should be doing something mobile, but I don't know which of the 50 things I should do. Do I do SMS or Bluetooth or start thinking about uh, augmented reality? And you kind of come away uh, a train trip to York to see Nestle. And they're very delighted afterwards because you kind of realize you only need to do three things out of the 40. So you've got to do some quite cool things ahead of mobile. But the thing that struck me in thinking about the year of mobile, I reckon there are about eight years of mobile in my whole time that were there. It's kind of this misstart that happened every single year. You could look at it back in 2010, and this is the point at which, if you look at the chart, smartphones actually overtook PCs, so that would be a pretty good year of mobile to stick it on. Um, something witty from the MMA in Asia um, was in 2011 when they actually they calculated there were more mobile phones than toothbrushes, so maybe that was the year of mobile. 2012, not just the year of mobile, but the year of tablet, that hasn't aged particularly well. Um, and then in 2013, you had the relegation dogfight of operating systems between the quickly climbing Windows phone, which finally killed off BlackBerry, and we'll kind of know what happened to the demise there. Forbes, entirely credible, brilliant publication, called it uh, in 2014. Is that the year of mobile? Uh, and in, uh, in 2015 was the last time the IAB ever did mobile engage. So for those of you that didn't know, there was a whole version of engage that was just for mobile. The fact that mobile has become so central to everything that you do that's kind of led us to think differently about it, the IB as well, and fully kind of integrate mobile into what we do. And rather than uh, mobile being a thing that we do becomes the thing that we do, I think. So um, hence why today is the last mobile engage. So that's 2015. 2016, this was the first email that landed in my inbox when I came in in January. Um, and it's a guy called Stuart uh, trying to sell me an early bird ticket to go to his event. What better way to get the attention of the head of mobile by making the subject is 2016 the year of mobile? 
Um, and then 2017, Google kind of says it too, but they said it in quite an intelligent way, and they're quite right. They called it the year uh, of mobile majority, and it's their consumer barometer survey. So they look at 63 countries across the world, and 2017 was the year in which in all of those 63 countries, uh, the use of the internet was at 50% or more uh, for mobile. But never fear, we got there in the end. 2018, last year, was actually the bona fide 100% uh, certified year of mobile, uh, particularly according to our uh, uh, ad spend study, which we do with PwC and using walk data to fill in some of the other media channels. 2018 was the year where advertisers spent more money in mobile than any other channel, more than telly, more than print, more than outdoor, more than radio, even more than desktop. As John talked about at the very start of the day, 51% of all uh, digital ad spend uh, last year was actually in smartphones. It's bigger than desktop. It's the biggest thing you can invest your money in. There were lots of reasons why we got to that fantastic number uh, and why last year uh, was bona fide the year of mobile. Um, lots of reasons. One of them was mobile pioneers. Some brilliant people who I never got to meet, people like Mary Meeker, who lots of you will know, uh, people that I was lucky enough to meet, people like this guy, Russell Buckley, uh, Simon Andrews, who writes the brilliant mobile fix on a Friday, Todd Tran, Benedict Evans, and then some people I was really lucky enough to work with, um, Claire Velotti, lucky enough to work with her twice, uh, and of course this hero. Making phone calls is still obviously very important. It's John Mew, Head of Mobile at the Internet Advertising Bureau. So I think if you ever get the chance to go and work for your heroes, you should do it, because it's definitely worthwhile. So you kind of get to this. Look, we've had, the, we've had the year of mobile. Brilliant. Is it the end of mobile? So this is Benedict Evans. So Benedict was an analyst. He moved to the West Coast. He now works for a venture, um, uh, an investment company. And this is his latest presentation. And he's documented the kind of the rise and rise of mobile. And he puts this chart up and he says, look, there's roughly 5.3 billion people in the world, of which 5 billion of them have got a smartphone, a, a mobile phone. So why are we kind of still talking about it? It's like Natalie's point earlier. It's kind of like electricity. You wouldn't put a chart up that says this many people exist and this many people have got electricity. It's kind of a nothing thing to talk about now. So why are we still talking about it? But I'm not sure it's the end of mobile but I think it changes the conversation. I think it's probably time for us to stop talking about the actual device, that really sophisticated piece of plastic and glass that used to live in your pocket or a purse, but now is sort of super glued to your hand everywhere you go. Um, I think it's more useful to talk about mobility, this idea that um, the internet is completely untethered and with you all the time. Um, and uh, when we start talking about the device, you start to think about some really interesting possibilities, about some of the new behaviours uh, that that's created. We think about context. We can think about uh, people's, different, um, people's different need states. And there's no better example, and I really wrap my brains on this one, to show you than one of the golden oldies. This is, uh, this is KitKat. And um, Kit KitKat thought about mobility in a slightly different way. They identified this need that everyone wants to be connected, and if you've got a smartphone and you've got a Wi-Fi connection, you can do it. Um, they have a platform which is all around taking a break. So they completely reversed the equation. They said, well, what if we can let people take a break? So they used it in a really smart way. Time for a break. In the KitKat free no Wi-Fi zone, a big sign with a small Wi-Fi jammer that blocks all signals in a five meter radius. We placed the sign in some hot spots in Amsterdam so that people could take a short break from their digital lives. Instead, they could read a good old newspaper or a real hardcover book. Some even had a genuine face-to-face -face conversation while munching on a Kit Kat. So when you start to sort of let the device go and what the device can do, think about it more broadly, you can start to do some interesting stuff. So I want to talk about three ways in which mobility can come to life. I want to talk about 5G. Nigel with a brilliant presentation this morning. He actually did all the heavy lifting and the stats for me, which I would have forgotten. Um, so thank you, Nigel. Um, I want to talk about 5G as this enabler for mobility. I want to talk about cameras, not necessarily the one in your phone, which is probably the most advanced camera you're ever going to own and the best one, but the fact that cameras are becoming ubiquitous everywhere. Uh, very public, very private, there for entertainment, there for uh, necessity. And I want to talk about gesture and how gesture is probably going to start to change uh, our relationship with technology. It's going to make the real world uh, more digital in a sense, and it's going to help uh, make digital things um, a little bit more real. 
Um, so when it comes to 5G, you can't talk about 5G without talking about 4G. The halcyon days of the 4G launch, carnival-like atmosphere on the streets of the UK, sort of. Um, I remember doing lots of presentations like this to Sony Music, which were basically comparison charts saying this is how long it's going to take you to download something on 3G, and this is how much quicker it's going to be on 4G. It was basically about a little bit more speed. Um, but 5G has launched. It launched last week. Um, Q, lots of sort of exclusively men actually taking screenshots of how fast uh, their connection is from Covent Garden and posting it. Um, launched in London as well as a number of other cities. And as uh, Nigel said this morning, it's about 20 times faster than 4G, but that only gives you one part of the puzzle. The really interesting bit for me is this idea of latency or lag or delay. And um, they think with 5G, you're going to be able to get that lag or delay down to less than one millisecond, which is kind of hard to get our heads around. And latency is kind of on trend at the moment. If you saw the Apple developer conference earlier this week, they're now claiming that the latency uh, in an Apple Pencil, uh, they've got it down from 20 milliseconds to five milliseconds, which kind of seems good. So when it touches that iPad screen, you kind of get zero delay at all. Uh, and zero delay is going to be um, incredibly important when you go to things like festivals or Paddington train station or places where everyone's trying to connect uh, at one point. And I'm desperate, desperate to try and do the maths on this. Imagine all those tiny points in a 24-hour day where you get a little bit of lag or delay. You're trying to watch something on YouTube, waiting for an app to load. And if you added those up over a week, over a month, over a year, I reckon it would add up to hours in these micro moments where we're just like waiting for something to happen. It's going to change the game. It's going to completely go away. Glastonbury is going to be the first ever 5G festival in the UK. And Birmingham New Street is going to be the first ever train station powered by 5G. So two brilliant use cases to get it right. Um, um, and as Nigel said, 5G is the first G, if you like, to be designed for things, not humans. So that means autonomous vehicles can start to talk to each other. They can talk to traffic lights. They can talk to the connected car park to see if there's any spaces. So that's why the delay and the latency and the lack of it is so important. Two drones talking to each other, you can't kind of have that five-second delay otherwise they're going to crash and fall out of the sky. So it's incredibly important. Um, and when it comes to things like immersive experiences, uh, someone described the experience of VR and the current plumbing that we've got now as eating the Mars bar with the wrapper on. We haven't really been doing it right. It hasn't been quick enough to experience how good it is, so we get this sort of instant disappointment and we don't do it again. Um, with 5G, you're going to get this incredible lifelike experience. Everything around you is going to be in this kind of ultra 4K experience. It's going to be wonderful. It's also going to work in the medical profession. This is my brother, Ben. I've used his image without any permission whatsoever. He's got no idea I'm showing it to 600 people in the Barbican. Uh, he's a couple of years younger than me, but this is him aged eight. So Ben was born with a congenital heart condition, which meant that every couple of years he had to wear one of these uh, electrocardiograms, an ECG. They basically wire him up and they give him this little um, tape machine and a bum bag that he has to wear for 24 hours. And they say to him, I'll just go and live normally for 24 hours. Kind of weird to say that to an eight-year-old kid because you don't want to go and play football or kind of lie in bed. Uh, and then he gives the tape back and they look at it, the doctors, and they kind of work out if everything's okay. 5G completely changes the game. Uh, ben could just put on some sensors, a bit like putting contact lenses on, as easy as that. And doctors in real time, with no delay on the other side of the world, could basically monitor his heart rate and see when stuff starts to either go right or wrong, and he just kind of lives his life normally. He doesn't have to do it for 24 hours and give it back. So if you think about something like health, it becomes inc incredibly proactive rather than how it is at the moment. You kind of feel sick, you call the doctor, and you go in where it's kind of reactive. So things can change. Closer to our world, of course, publishing uh, and journalism is going to see a massive benefit. This is Mark Thompson, the CEO of the New York Times. Um, he is couching 5G as the biggest thing to benefit journalism and publishers since Twitter. And if you think about journalism before Twitter, you'd kind of go to something, you'd report on it, the editor would sign it off, it would get published. Twitter uh, suddenly enabled these people to tell stories, to share links, to get comments, to be absolutely in the moment and for everything to be really, really public. Uh, so big words from Mark Thompson there. And then if we drill down even more to our tiny bubble here at the Barbican today, um, 5G is actually going to make the online user experience better. So this is a, a chart from a piece of research that we carried out at the end of last year where we asked a consumer panel um, basically asking about their attitudes towards online advertising and online in general. This specific question, we asked them, what are the things that annoy you when you go online? Uh, interestingly, only 4% of them said advertising, but 27% of them, even more profound when you ask 16 to 24-year-olds, is around 35% of them, um, said it's slow load times. So if actually 5G can be this enabler that reduces that, people having a better, more useful time online can only be a good thing. On cameras then, so 
um, as I said, that smartphone in your pocket is just incredibly advanced and sophisticated. We're probably using like 5% of what it's actually capable of. Uh, but beyond that, cameras are starting to appear everywhere. And, and facial recognition is kind of fascinating me at the moment. Um, this is uh, a couple of screenshots from my Nest cam at home. It's my Nest security camera, which sits outside my house. Now, if you think about CCTV of old, there was these kind of tiny, grainy cameras that uh, if someone nicked something or broke into your house, you could kind of watch back. It probably only stored 24 hours, and then you could sort of day that piece again, very reactive. The Nest is so sophisticated, it can actually identify the people who are coming to my house, and it will ping me and say, oh, we think we've seen this person more than once before. Do you want to give them a name? Oh, yeah, it's my wife, Polly. And then when Polly's next at the door, it would say, oh, Polly's at the door. So it really like, humanizes the tech. It's sort of incredibly sophisticated. On the right, it's, uh, it's our friend Alex. This is all the times that it's kind of seen, um, that, that it's seen Alex. And of course, it's on my terms completely. If I wanted to forget Alex, then I don't need to do it. But really useful, really personal. Here's the other side of the spectrum. Here's the kind of the worst case scenario. This is the back of a taxi in Japan. Uh, and it's a taxi tablet, and it's telling you that it's using facial recognition to identify your gender. And based on that, it's going to serve you, um, what's the word they use? Optimized content, kind of like targeted advertising, if you like. This is like the worst thing we can do with such brilliant technology, is just try and make ads a little bit more relevant uh, by doing it. It seems such a waste. It's sort of really lazy. It's like 1% of what's possible. So that's the thing we have to avoid. If you want to look into the future of what facial recognition could look like here, though, you have to look no further than China. Chinese company uh, Face++ Plus Plus is raising a huge amount of money in this area. Just look at some of the sophistication they've got here, not just face detection, beauty score, emotion recognition, skin status evaluation, skeleton detection. I mean, this stuff is incredibly advanced. And it probably says a lot about our own Western attitudes towards, uh, towards privacy, what we kind of think maybe ethically is okay versus where the technology's at somewhere else. Uh, this is how you take cash out in, uh, in China. So you don't need a sort of a, a piece of plastic and need to remember a four digit pin. You just hit the withdrawal by face. It works out kind of who you are and you take out your money. This is the equivalent in the UK, not to damn it down. This is get cash if you're a NatWest customer. So if you forget your card, you can still go to a cash point and take out some cash. A little bit more clunky, they have to send you a code. There's a bunch of kind of T's and C's that you need here. So the tech is there, it's really our attitude as to how we feel about this. And this is the tonic to that awful back of the taxi in Japan uh, idea. Again, it's one of the golden oldies. The context here is that in 2014, the Spanish government put um, a huge tax on people going to live events. And as a result, people stopped going. People stopped going to theater and to comedy clubs, and they stayed in. And profits from these places were falling. Um, but this particular theater in Barcelona uses facial rec recognition technology in a really thoughtful way to solve a problem. Pay per laugh, the first comedy shows where you only pay for what you consume. We fitted each seat with a facial recognition system that detects the smile and proposed the following deal to spectators. Entrance will be totally free. If the show produces no laughs, you don't pay anything. However, if you laugh, you have to pay for each smile. Each smile produced is worth 30 euro cents, something that in this day and age is quite a reasonable price. At the end of the show, the spectator could check their laughter account before paying and even share it on social networks. And so that no one would cry for having laughed more than they could afford, the maximum amount to pay was 80 laughs for 24 euros. The average price of the ticket increased by 6 euros. Each paper laugh show produced 28,000 euros more ticket money than was normally taken. Currently, the system is being copied in other theatres in Spain. A mobile phone app was created as a system of payment, and the first season ticket was launched for the number of laughs, not shows. We should also not write off the paper cry. Or paper what the fuck system. What the fuck? What the fuck? Or maybe not. Paper laugh. The first comedy shows where you only pay for what you consume. It kind of just goes to show you can either default to what's worked before and you can try and fudge it and do this, the, the back of the Japan tactic. You can think about how technology can solve some really interesting problems. So, the last thing I want to talk about then is, uh, is gesture. 
and much has been made of, of uh, Jester is a bit like the sort of the forgotten sort of younger brother of voice. Voice has been in kind of high demand, lots of work has been done on voice, natural language processing is at such an advanced level now, it really is going to be this incredible thing that we have. But if I think about my relationship with Siri and Alexa and Cortana and Google, I don't talk to it like I talk to John or something like that, I still have to learn how to talk to it in a certain way. I can't quite do the conversational thing yet, so I kind of have to learn how to talk to these things. Gesture, for me, on the other hand, is a completely natural thing. We've kind of been doing it for years. It's really intuitive. It's, uh, it's incredibly tactile. It's more discreet. Um, and I think what gesture will do is really start to untether, us, to untether us from the devices that we have, be that watches or phones. Um, and, and just thinking about the Google presentation that you saw, that's exactly what their aim is. The, the kind of the technology stays in your pocket and we just kind of do the things that we know. Um, here's the forerunner of gesture as we know it today. Did anyone ever own a Nintendo Power Glove in 1989? Maybe a lucky hand over there. Um, uh, it was a bit shit, actually. It, um, it, it, it wasn't particularly accurate. Nintendo only bothered to make two games that it kind of works with, so no one did it. But it was immortalised in, uh, in the 1989 film of the same year called The Wizard. Power Glove. I love the power glove. It's so bad. It's so bad. Um, so that's the power glove. That's 1989. Uh, a few years later, this is my uh, this is my favourite car journalist, uh, Matt Watson from Carwell, and he does loads and loads. He's brilliant. You should watch him. This is him reviewing the new BMW 7 Series last year. And there's another thing I can do. I can control it with gestures. So to turn up the volume on the stereo, I, I can just it. waggle my finger around, and it does that. So there we go. So you kind of get to this place where maybe not a lot has changed in kind of 29 years uh, from Lucas Barton in 89 uh, through to Matt Watson now. Um, but here's something that really does change the game. And, and Emma was talking earlier about uh, Project Jacquard. This is from the same advanced technology and projects group at Google. It's called Project Solly. Uh, and their aim is to build these tiny radars that basically recognize gesture, so it can start to appear on anything. So rather than you having to take your hands off a steering wheel or off a, uh, a bike handlebar or even get out of bed to make your phone snooze, it will just recognize tiny gestures that you do, turning something up, pushing something across. And just think, one, how kind of beautifully elegant it is, but how it completely unpairs you from these, these different devices that we've got. This idea that we pick our phone up hundreds and hundreds of times a day, that we could actually do it in a far more discreet way. And it could absolutely revol revolutionize um, the, the way that we use touchscreen. Uh, and beyond gesture, you've got things like haptics. So haptics, the idea that you have this relationship with technology, you touch technology, and in some way it kind of touches you back. Um, it gives us that sense of connection. This is a massive growing industry worth uh, around 20 billion last year. And um, there's a kind of a really lovely human thing about haptics. I think about haptics in my life. My Garmin watch, when I, when I beat one of my personal records on Strava, just kind of jumps off my wrist and gives me that amazing feedback that I've done really well. If, if your phone can charge via contactless, that lovely hum when you put your phone on top of the contactless charge just hums back at you to let you know you've done it. There's all these tiny things in our life which give us that bit of feedback which make us feel a bit better. Uh, and of course, Volvo have this, um, uh, the, the lane assistance technology that if you're going to waver out of the lane, not only will the steering wheel pull you back in, but the steering wheel kind of vibrate, almost like a game used to. So um, some stuff that's kind of nice and makes us feel good, but some stuff that's really necessary as well. Um, and there are some amazing companies in this space when you start to dig into it. One of them is called Ultra Haptics. Now, they're a company that, that specialise in mid-air haptics, so I don't even need to touch something for it to give me feedback. They use ultrasound to, so I'm kind of here, and I, could, I would be able to kind of feel, uh, feel, feel that glass. They're incredible. Um, the latest bit of work they've done is work on a horror film. Horror is a kind of interesting genre for touch. If you've ever been through a ghost train, it is really, really terrifying, but the moment someone brushes past you, it just completely shits you out. Um, this is what touch can add to, uh, uh, to something like horror. So there's no wearables required with this. You're literally just using your hands. And in this next clip, it's the point in the story, you're going to see the reaction where uh, the, first, uh, the first lady is um, touching the ice-cold hands of this old lady. 
And then the second one here is putting her hands into fire. Oh my god. My hands on fire. Oh my god. My hands on fire. But so what? So we've had the year of mobile. We've had it for years. We think it finally happened last year. Stop thinking about mobile, start thinking about mobility. Mobility is interesting, there's three things. 5G is going to um, uh, really help it along. Cameras are kind of everywhere and there's a massive opportunity there if we get it right. And, and haptics and gesture are going to change our relationship with technology. But the so what became really apparent to me last week when I saw this quote on Twitter. This is from Laura, jo uh, Laura Jordan Bamback. She's the chief creative, of creative officer at Mr. President. And she was talking last week at the biggest marketing festival in India. And she said this, as creators, we look for the least creative places for inspiration. We look at other ads, we look at ads from the past, and we look at data. That is not where creativity lies. Now, her speaking those words, she didn't realize the context in which I was gonna use them, but I think they kind of fit perfectly. What we have, when we start to think about mobility and not the device, is this massive opportunity to do some really, really interesting things. But we really have to be careful. If we just think about 5G as a means to make bigger ads that are much heavier, that are gonna ruin the user experience, we've kind of missed the point. If we're just gonna reduce all the brilliant things about facial recognition and these ubiquitous cameras that are everywhere, just to target someone with a slightly more targeted ad, we've kind of missed the point. And if we take all the amazing capabilities that haptics and gesture give us, and we just create the equivalent of like a virtual click-through rate, because that's what's worked before, we kind of completely miss the point. Um, and, a, and a notice on experts as well. Um, the, the, those heads of mobiles and the mobile, global mobile directors and mobile leads, they were so necessary in that time when we were kind of, uh, when you needed them, you really needed, needed them to understand stuff, the really technical stuff. Um, I think what you need now is really smart people, really smart planners, really smart thinkers who can think about some of those new behaviours that they've created, um, who don't just think about the device and the technology, but can think about how you use technology to make stuff better. Um, I'm going uh, to uh, shut up there because you've got the brilliant Tina Dahili coming up next. But thank you very much for listening. Yeah.